In the opening scene, the film introduces us to Bernard Garrett in Willis, Texas, 1939. He works as a shoeshine boy outside a bank, eavesdropping on customers talking about money and real estate investments, jotting down useful information. One day, while listening in on a bank meeting, a police officer notices him and begins to follow him. That evening, Bernard's father confronts him after reviewing his financial notebook, remarking that although he is smart, no white man would let him make money. White man won't let him no matter how good at it you are. Bernard, however, insists on making it big. In the next scene, set in 1954 Los Angeles, Bernard and his wife Eunice, along with their son, little Bernard, drive to visit Eunice's uncle. The uncle tells Bernard that Northrop is hiring black workers and he could get a job there, but Bernard politely declines. Well, thank you, sir, but I came here to try my hand at real estate. His plan is to own property and rent it out. The uncle laughs and claims he won't succeed, but Bernard's wife has faith in him and believes her husband will be successful. Before they can afford their own home, the family rents a shed in Eunice's uncle's backyard. The next day, Bernard drives his cousin Tony to work. Tony's friend, a white young man named Matt, is surprised that Bernard owns a car and wonders what he does for a living. Hey, you didn't tell me you had a rich uncle. Nice to meet you. Tony responds that Bernard owns buildings. Bernard then tours several properties and calls their owners to discuss prices. Days later, Bernard takes his wife to see a house in a white neighborhood they could buy, but they don't have enough money for renovations. His wife then takes him to see Joe, a potential co-investor she worked with before marrying. Bernard finds Joe's behavior too loose and unserious, like a playboy, ah, congratulations, and leaves without revealing his business idea, telling his wife he won't work with Joe. His wife is upset, believing Bernard misjudged Joe and hopes Bernard would reconsider talking to him. Bernard later meets with Patrick, the owner of a property he can afford, and proposes that if he buys the building, he could lend Patrick $10,000 for renovations. Patrick explains that he does not engage in such deals and uses numbers and calculations to explain why. However, his explanation is slightly inaccurate and Bernard quickly corrects him, impressing Patrick as few have such knowledge. Despite this, Patrick still refuses to lend him money. In Patrick's office, Bernard notices a gift on the shelf behind him, a gift from a banker named Mr. Reed who works at the town bank. Bernard then drives to the town bank to speak with the banker, but Mr. Reed's secretary, prejudiced against black people, prevents Bernard from meeting him. Mr. Reed can't meet with you right now. Bernard waits outside the bank, and when Mr. Reed leaves work, Bernard introduces himself stating he has a business concept that would benefit both him and Patrick, convince him to lend him a loan, but Mr. Reed declines. Disappointed, Bernard returns home to the shed, feeling frustrated at not being able to convince Mr. Reed. Suddenly, he receives a call from Patrick, who, having heard that Bernard approached his banker using his name for a loan, appears serious and says he will make the deal because he appreciates people who don't follow typical business norms like himself. The next day, Bernard and his wife celebrate at a nightclub where Joe approaches them and they have a brief conversation. The following day, people see Bernard and Tony renovating the property Bernard purchased. A white woman passes by and tells them they are not allowed there. This is a white building. You can't own this place. But Bernard asserts his ownership of the property. Then someone sees Matt helping Tony and Bernard with the renovations. Bernard asks Matt if he could work for him, to which Matt replies that he has always worked for others. Bernard rephrases the question, asking if Matt is comfortable working for a black man. Matt responds that the only color he cares about is green, the color of his money. They start the renovations, but soon two police officers arrive, telling Bernard that a lady in the building called claiming he was impersonating the owner. Matt tries to defend Bernard, but the police tell him to be quiet. I'm not talking to you. Bernard presents documents proving his ownership, and as the police leave, the old lady realizes that Bernard and his family have moved in as tenants. She immediately leaves, unable to tolerate the presence of black people. Days later, more affluent black families move in, and the property quickly fills up. Patrick recognizes Bernard's accomplishments and real estate acumen, proposing they each take a 50% stake and collaborate on acquiring more rental properties. Bernard thinks that by negotiating prices over the phone and having Patrick appear to sign contracts on behalf of the company, they could expand faster, and Patrick happily agrees. Together with the support of Matt, Tony, and Bernard's wife, they renovate and furnish more exquisite residences. One day, Bernard brings his wife to a large house and asks what kind of furniture she wants. 
but soon surprises her by announcing it as their new home. Months later one morning, Patrick is found dead in bed. Patrick's wife eventually gives Bernard 25% stake in all the buildings they jointly owned at a discount. Bernard finds this absurd, but since his name is not on any documents, his only choice is to accept the 25% stake or get nothing. And if you see fit to refuse that, Garrett, you can walk away with nothing. Bernard goes to find Reed, hoping he can provide proof. Mr. Reed refuses to meet with Bernard. When Bernard notices that many financial companies are renting space in the large banking building, he has an epiphany. He approaches Joe, who now owns 18 rental properties. If they collaborate, they might have a chance to buy the banker's building. This would mean the 12 banks renting space there would have to reconsider their loan policies towards them. If they aren't refused loans, they could start buying more houses in white neighborhoods and expand more quickly. Joe can't understand why, as black men, anyone would sell them the houses. Convince me. So they invite Matt to be the spokesperson for their new venture. Matt admits he knows nothing about business and is skeptical. You want me to what? Even though they're willing to teach him everything they know. Later, Matt meets a beautiful high school classmate at a restaurant. The girl takes an interest in him and asks about his job. He tells her he is a partner in real estate, which boosts his vanity in front of her. Partnership. A few days later, Matt returns to Bernard and Joe, saying he is willing to take the job. Joe tells him to meet at the golf club at 6 a.m. the next day. Matt needs to learn golf to impress the banking owners, so Joe trains him. Bernard also meets Donald, an old banker trusted by Joe, who is willing to lend them $200,000 to purchase the bank property. Bernard assures Donald that he will acquire it for less than this price. I can get that building for under two. People then see Bernard instructing Matt in real estate appraisal. Matt quickly picks up the tricks. Matt learns proper dining etiquette and buys a nice suit. One day, while Matt golfing like a pro and doing mental calculations, they decide he is ready. They discuss the deal for the banking building and Bernard mentions they have arranged for Matt to meet the building's owner, Charles Renault, at an upscale golf club. A few days later, Matt meets Charles as planned and impresses him with his golf skills. They agree to meet to discuss the price of the banking building, possibly sealing the deal. A week later, on his way to the meeting, Matt is spiritedly practicing in the car. The meeting goes smoothly, and Matt's sharp real estate market knowledge and quick mental calculations impress Charles again. One million three hundred eighty-three. One million one hundred fifty. They finally agree to Matt's purchase of the building for one point five six million dollars. People see them celebrating the purchase and establishing good relationships with the bankers. They continue purchasing bigger and better properties in white neighborhoods. The trio later become real estate magnates and eventually meet the U.S. vice president passing by the banking building. Years later, they visit Bernard's father in Willis, Texas, where his father expresses his pride in Bernard. The next day, while walking with his son, little Bernard, they notice the Continental Bank, where Bernard once shined shoes for the wealthy outside. Back in Los Angeles, Bernard tells Joe that he wants to buy the Texas bank. Joe claims that running a bank is extremely complicated and beyond their experience, especially considering the hostile environment towards black business owners in Texas. Bernard suggests they could use Matt as a front, similar to their acquisition of the banker's building. With the help of Joe's banker friend Donald, Matt purchases the Continental Bank for Bernard and Joe, with the previous owner and his son Florence retaining a 20% stake. They soon begin to quietly allow responsible black individuals to take loans, doubling the loan volume. This enables some black families to afford better homes and some black businesses to increase their income after three months. Florence, the son of the former owner and a bank executive, discovers they are lending to black people. One day, he confronts them, claiming the bank could face a run if it's found out that they are lending to black people. That's fraud. Florence produces a document stating that the Treasury Department will inspect in a month due to anonymous allegations of issuing too many risky loans. Matt then discusses with Joe and Bernard how to solve the problem. He suggests they could buy another small bank, which he would personally manage, and use financial techniques to distribute loans between the two institutions, significantly reducing the risk of government closure due to excessive loans. Joe and Bernard think it's a bad idea because Matt has only three months of banking experience. Matt then expresses his gratitude for everything they've taught him, but states he would step back from helping them unless given the opportunity to be a partner and owner. I just want to be more like you. 
despite their dire situation. Joe and Bernard agree. Matt purchases the newly acquired Marin Bank and becomes a shareholder. Within days, they start restructuring the finances as planned to mitigate risks. Bernard at Train creates a list of loans that need to be resigned at the new bank and instructs Matt to double check all the loans before signing and to work only with their trusted lawyer. However, Matt, having believed in his own skills and powers, decides to step away from their plan. He hires a lawyer by the advice of Florence, who most likely ratted out the bank to the controller of the currency. During the signing of the contracts, Matt, with a serious facial expression, runs through the list of loan agreements without even bothering to study them properly. He's worried that he might mess up the bank's management. A few days later, Florence calls him and tells him that white customers are coming to Mainland Bank and withdrawing all their money because someone told them that the bank gives loans to black people. On top of that, the examiner of the controller of the currency starts his inspection in the new bank on the anonymous tip. Matt quickly calls Bernard to inform him about the situation. I'm at Marlin, not Mainland. Bernard tells his wife that Matt is in trouble and that he needs to attend the meeting with the auditor to prevent Matt from making a mistake, but it's not possible for him to be there. Eunice suggests that he disguise himself as a janitor so he can assist Matt from outside the conference room. Bernard, in a janitor's uniform, tries to help Matt explain to the examiner how the transactions in their bank are carried out, but it doesn't help much because the examiner finds loans that such a small bank cannot own. Matt runs out to his partners in the restroom to get clues for action. Bernard doesn't understand how these loans got into this bank. How the hell did these loans get in the package? I don't know. How the hell did our lawyer miss that? I didn't make it so I hired someone else. Who exactly did you ask to find this lawyer? It's Florence. They understand perfectly well that Florence set it up on purpose and are surprised that Matt doesn't realize it himself. After the check, the partners decide to sell the small bank in order to save the mainland bank. But Matt isn't ready to give up the bank where he is finally in charge of the whole process. Matt keeps screwing up. He buys the loans back on behalf of the mainland bank. Joe is informed about that by their trusted banker who they have worked with for years in LA. Together with Bernard, they rush to mainland in order to stop Matt. But no sooner do they explain to Matt how badly he screwed up than the deputy controller of the currency bursts into the bank and announces that their banking license has been revoked for suspicious transactions and the bank is being placed in FDIC receivership. At the exit of the bank, they are caught and arrested by the FBI, not without Bernard's resistance. In Washington, before a public hearing in the Senate, a lawyer says that they want to use their case to tweak the laws regarding banking. In other words, they want to use Bernard to tighten control on banking. The senator himself talks to Matt and tells him that he needs to cast the blame on his partners so that he doesn't end up in jail for 50 years. Matt does so at the first hearing. He admits that he was manipulated and his partners were pulling the strings and all these deals were made by him under pressure from Bernard. Next, the senator talks to Bernard and tells him to confess how he deliberately took advantage of a loophole in the law to illegally enrich himself. Then Congress will fix the laws to favor whites and Bernard will be free. But if he decides to take his case to court and rant about racial discrimination, he is looking at jail time. The second day of the hearing is here. Bernard pulls out his janitor's uniform and declares that this is the only way black people can enter a bank in Texas, even though the Constitution says all citizens are equal. The senator tries his best to interrupt Bernard's speech, but the man makes a brilliant speech about race discrimination. Of course, the Senate isn't satisfied with such a speech and the federal government seizes their assets. Following this hearing, an all-white jury in Texas convicts them of misappropriation of bank funds and sentences them to three years in federal prison. Meanwhile, Florence purchases the mainland bank in a sale arranged by the FDIC for a fraction of the cost Bernard and Joe paid Florence's father for it. Three years after their testimony before the Senate, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act, which made it illegal to refuse to sell or rent property on the basis of race, religion, or gender. Three years later, Bernard is released from prison, where he is met by Joe and his wife. The men are overjoyed that they got off easy, but Bernard's wife doesn't understand what they're so happy about since they are bankrupt now. What are you two laughing about? Then Bernard admits that before the first hearing, Matt called him and admitted that the senator pressured him and he would have to testify against Bernard.
Bernard then asked him for one favor, to sell some of their assets and buy him and Joe two mansions in the Bahamas. This was successfully accomplished by Matt. Friends moved to the Bahamas in their luxurious mansions. 